Macmillan Audio presents A Dog's Purpose, a novel for humans by W. Bruce Cameron. Read for you by William Dufries. To Catherine, for doing everything, for being everything. One. One day it occurred to me that the warm, squeaky, smelly things squirming around next to me were my brothers and sister. I was very disappointed. Though my vision had resolved itself only to the point where I could distinguish fuzzy forms in the light, I knew that the large and beautiful shape with the long, wonderful tongue was my mother. I had figured out that when the chill air struck my skin, it meant she had gone somewhere. But when the warmth returned, it would be time to feed. Often finding a place to suckle meant pushing aside what I now knew was the snout of a sibling seeking to crowd me out of my share, which was really irritating. I couldn't see that my brothers and sister had any purpose whatsoever. When my mother licked my stomach to stimulate the flow of fluids from under my tail, I blinked at her, silently beseeching her to please get rid of the other puppies for me. I wanted her all to myself. Gradually, the other dogs came into focus, and I grudgingly accepted their presence in the nest. My nose soon told me I had one sister and two brothers. Sister was only slightly less interested in wrestling with me than my brothers, one of whom I thought of as fast, because he somehow always moved more quickly than I could. The other one I mentally called hungry, because he whimpered whenever mother was gone and would suckle her with an odd desperation, as if it were never enough. Hungry slept more than my siblings than I did, so we often jumped on him and chewed on his face. Our den was scooped out underneath the black roots of a tree and was cool and dark during the heat of the day. The first time I tottered out into the sunlight, Sister and Fast accompanied me, and naturally Fast shoved his way to the front. Of the four of us, only Fast had a splash of white on his face, and as he trotted jauntily forward, this patch of fur flashed in the daylight. I'm special, Fast's dazzling star-shaped spot seemed to be declaring to the world. The rest of him was as mottled and unremarkably brown and black as I was. Hungry was several shades lighter, and Sister shared Mother's stubby nose and flattened forehead. But we all looked more or less the same, despite Fast's prancing. Our tree was perched on a creek bank and I was delighted when Fast tumbled head over heels down the bank, though Sister and I plummeted with no more grace when we tried to make the same descent. Slippery rocks and a tiny trickle of water offered wonderful odors, and we followed the wet trail of the creek into a moist, cool cave, a culvert with metal sides. I knew instinctively that this was a good place to hide from danger, but Mother was unimpressed with our find and hauled us unceremoniously back to the den when it turned out our legs weren't powerful enough to enable us to scale back up the bank. We had learned the lesson that we couldn't return to the nest on our own when we went down the bank, so as soon as Mother left the nest, we did it again. This time Hungry joined us, though once he was in the culvert he sprawled in the cool mud and fell asleep. Exploring seemed like the right thing to do. We needed to find other things to eat. Mother, getting impatient with us, was standing up when we weren't even finished feeding, which I could only blame on the other dogs. If Hungry weren't so relentless, if Fast weren't so bossy, if Sister didn't wiggle so much, I knew Mother would hold still and allow us to fill our bellies. Couldn't I always coax her to lie down, usually with a sigh, when I reached up for her while she stood above us? Often Mother would spend extra time licking Hungry while I seethed at the injustice. By this time, Fast and Sister had both grown larger than I. My body was the same size, but my legs were shorter and stubbier. Hungry was the runt of the litter, of course, and it bothered me that Fast and Sister always abandoned me to play with each other, as if Hungry and I belonged together out of some sort of natural order in the pack. Since Fast and Sister were more interested in each other than the rest of the family, I punished them by depriving them of my company, going off by myself deep into the culvert. I was sniffing at something deliciously dead and rotten one day, when right in front of me a tiny animal exploded into the air. A frog! Delighted, I leaped forward, attempting to pounce on it with my paws, but the frog jumped again. It was afraid although all I wanted to do was play and probably wouldn't eat it. 
Fast and Sister sensed my excitement and came stampeding into the culvert, knocking me over as they skidded to a stop in the slimy water. The frog hopped and Fast lunged at it, using my head as a springboard. I snarled at him, but he ignored me. Sister and Fast fell all over themselves to get at the frog, who managed to land in a pool of water and kick away in silent, rapid strokes. Sister put her muzzle in the pond and snorted, sneezing water over Fast and me. Fast climbed on her back, the frog, my frog, forgotten. Sadly, I turned away. It looked as though I lived in a family of dimwits. I was to think of that frog often in the days that followed, usually just as I drifted off to sleep. I found myself wondering how it would have tasted. More and more frequently, Mother would growl softly when we approached, and the day she clicked her teeth together in warning when we came at her in a greedy tumble, I despaired that my siblings had ruined everything. Then Fast crawled to her, his belly low, and she lowered her snout to him. He licked her mouth, and she rewarded him by bringing up food, and we rushed forward to share. Fast pushed us away, but we knew the trick now. And when I sniffed and licked my mother's jaws, she gave me a meal. At this point, we had all become thoroughly familiar with the creek bed and had tracked up and down it until the whole area was redolent with our odors. Fast and I spent most of our time dedicated to the serious business of play, and I was beginning to understand how important it was to him for the game to wind up with me on my back, his mouth chewing my face and throat. Sister never challenged him. But I still wasn't sure I liked what everyone seemed to assume was the natural order of our pack. Hungry, of course, didn't care about his status. So when I was frustrated, I bit his ears. One afternoon I was drowsily watching Sister and Fast yank on a scrap of cloth they had found when my ears perked up. An animal of some kind was coming, something large and loud. I scrambled to my feet But before I could race down the creek bed to investigate the noise, Mother was there, her body rigid with warning. I saw with surprise that she had hungry in her teeth, carrying him in a fashion that we'd left behind weeks ago. She led us into the dark culvert and crouched down, her ears flat against her head. The message was clear, and we heeded it, shrinking back from the tunnel opening in silence. When the thing came into view, striding along the creek bed, I felt Mother's fear ripple across her back. It was big. It stood on two legs, and an acrid smoke wafted from its mouth as it shambled toward us. I stared intently, absolutely fascinated. For reasons I couldn't fathom, I was drawn to this creature, compelled and I even tensed, preparing to bound out to greet it. One look from my mother, though, and I decided against it. This was something to be feared, to be avoided at all costs. It was, of course, a man, the first one I had ever seen. The man never glanced in our direction. He scaled the bank and disappeared from view, and after a few moments, Mother slid out into the sunlight and raised her head to see if the danger had passed. She relaxed then and came back inside, giving each of us a reassuring kiss. I ran out to see for myself and found myself disheartened when all that remained of the man's presence was a lingering scent of smoke in the air. Over and over again the next few weeks, Mother reinforced the message we'd all learned in that culvert. Avoid men at all costs. Fear them. The next time Mother went to hunt, we were allowed to go with her. Once we were away from the security of the den, her behavior became timid and skittish, and we all emulated her actions. We steered clear of open spaces, slinking along next to bushes. If we saw a person, Mother would freeze, her shoulders tense, ready to run. At these times, Fast's patch of white fur seemed as obtrusive as a bark, but no one ever noticed us. Mother showed us how to tear into the filmy bags behind houses, quickly scattering inedible papers and revealing chunks of meat, crusts of bread, and bits of cheese, which we chewed to the best of our ability. 
The tastes were exotic, and the smells were wonderful. But Mother's anxiety affected all of us, and we ate quickly, savoring nothing. Almost immediately, Hungry brought up his meal, which I thought was pretty funny, until I, too, felt my insides gripped in a powerful spasm. It seemed to go down easier the second time. I'd always been aware of other dogs, though I'd never personally met any except those in my own family. Sometimes, when we were out hunting, they barked at us from behind fences, most likely jealous that we were trotting around free while they were imprisoned. Mother, of course, never let us approach any of the strangers, while Fast usually bristled a little, somehow insulted that anybody would dare call out to us while he lifted his leg on their trees. Occasionally, I even saw a dog in a car. The first time this happened, I stared in wonderment at his head hanging out the window, tongue lolling out. He barked joyously when he spotted me, but I was too astounded to do anything but lift my nose and sniff in disbelief. Cars and trucks were something else Mother evaded, though I didn't see how they could be dangerous if there were sometimes dogs inside them. A large, loud truck came around frequently and took away all the bags of food people left out for us, and then meals would be scarce for a day or two. I didn't like that truck, nor the greedy men who hopped off it to scoop up all the food for themselves, despite the fact that they and their trucks smelled glorious. There was less time for play now that we were hunting. Mother snarled when Hungry tried to lick her lips, hoping for a meal, and we all got the message. We went out often, hiding from sight, desperately searching for food. I felt tired and weak now, and didn't even try to challenge fast when he stood with his head over my back, thrusting his chest at me. Fine, let him be the boss. As far as I was concerned, my short legs were better suited for the low, slinking run our mother had taught us anyway. If fast felt he was making some sort of point by using his height to knock me over, he was fooling himself. Mother was the dog in charge. There was barely room for all of us underneath the tree now, and Mother was gone for longer and longer periods of time. Something told me that one of these days, she wouldn't come back. We would have to fend for ourselves, fast, always pushing me out of the way, trying to take my share. Mother wouldn't be there to look after me. I began to think of what it would be like to leave the den. The day everything changed began with Hungry stumbling into the culvert to lie down instead of going on the hunt, his breathing labored, his tongue sticking out of his mouth. Mother nuzzled Hungry before she left, and when I sniffed at him, his eyes remained shut. Over the culvert was a road, and along the road we had once found a large dead bird, which we had all torn into until Fast picked it up and ran off with it. Despite the danger of being seen, we tended to range up and down this road, looking for more birds, which was what we were doing when Mother suddenly raised her head in alarm. We all heard it the same instant. A truck approaching. But not just any truck. This same vehicle, making the same sounds, had been back and forth along our road several times the past few days, moving slowly, even menacingly, as if hunting specifically for us. We followed Mother as she darted back to the culvert, but for reasons I'll never fully understand, I stopped and looked back at the monstrous machine, taking an extra few seconds before I followed Mother into the safety of the tunnel. Those few seconds proved to make all the difference. They had spotted me. With a low, rumbling vibration, the truck came to a stop directly overhead. The engine clanked and went quiet and then we heard the sounds of boots on gravel. Mother gave a soft whimper. When the human faces appeared at either end of the culvert, Mother went low, tensing her body. They showed their teeth at us, but it didn't seem to be a hostile gesture. Their faces were brown, marked with black hair, black brows, and dark eyes. Here, yeah, boy, one of them whispered, I didn't know what it meant, but the call seemed as natural as the sound of the wind, as if I'd been listening to men speak my whole life. Both men had poles, I now saw, poles with ropes looped on the end. 
They appeared threatening, and I felt Mother's panic boil over. Her claws scrabbling, she bolted, her head down, aiming for the space between the legs of one of the men. The pole came down, there was a quick snap, and then my mother was twisting and jerking as the man hauled her out into the sunlight. Sister and I backed up, cowering, while Fast growled, his fur bristling on the back of his neck. Then it occurred to all three of us that while the way behind us was still blocked, the tunnel mouth in front of us was now clear. We darted forward. Here they come, the man behind us yelled. Once out in the creek bed, we realized we didn't really know what to do next. Sister and I stood behind Fast. He wanted to be the boss, so okay, let him deal with this. There was no sign of Mother. The two men were on opposite banks, though, each wielding his pole. Fast dodged one, but then was snagged by the other. Sister took advantage of the melee to escape, her feet splashing in the water as she scampered away. But I stood rooted, staring up at the road. A woman with long white hair stood there above us, her face wrinkled in kindness. Here, puppy, it's okay. You'll be all right. Here, puppy, she said. I didn't run. I didn't move. I allowed the loop of rope to slip over my face and tighten on my neck. The pole guided me up the bank, where the man seized me by the scruff of the neck. He's okay. He's okay, the woman crooned. Let him go. He'll run off, the man warned. Let him go. I followed this bit of dialogue without comprehension, only understanding that somehow the woman was in charge, though she was older and smaller than either of the two men. With a reluctant grunt, the man lifted the rope off my neck. The woman offered her hands to me, rough, leathery palms, coated with a flowery smell. I sniffed them, then lowered my head, a clear sense of caring and concern radiated off of her. When she ran her fingers along my fur, I felt a shiver pass through me. My tail whipped the air of its own accord, and when she astonished me by lifting me into the air, I scrambled to kiss her face, delighting in her laughter. The mood turned somber when one of the men approached, holding Hungry's limp body. The man showed it to the woman who clucked mournfully. Then he took it to the truck where Mother and Fast were in a metal cage and held it up to their noses. The scent of death, recognizable to me as any memory, wafted off of Hungry in the dry, dusty air. We all carefully smelled my dead brother, and I understood the men wanted us to know what had happened to Hungry. Sadness came from all of them as they stood there silently in the road. But they didn't know how sick Hungry had been, sick from birth, and not long for the world. I was put in the cage, and Mother sniffed disapprovingly at the woman's smell, which had been pressed into my fur. With a lurch, the truck started up again. Then I was quickly distracted by the wonderful odors flowing through the cage as we moved down the road. I was riding in a truck. I barked in delight, Fast and Mother jerking their heads in surprise at my outburst. I couldn't help myself. It was the most exciting thing that had ever happened in my whole life, including almost catching the frog. Fast seemed overcome with sadness, and it took me a moment to understand. Sister, his favorite companion, was gone, as lost to us as was hungry. There was, I reflected, much more complexity to the world than I had supposed. It wasn't just about mother and my siblings hiding from people, hunting and playing in the culvert. Larger events had the ability to change everything, events that were controlled by human beings. I was wrong about one thing. Though we didn't know it at the time, Fast and I would meet up with Sister again in the future. Wherever we were headed on our truck ride, I had the sense we'd see other dogs when we got there.
The cage in which we were being held was positively flooded with the scent of other canines, their urine and feces and even their blood mixed with fur and saliva. While Mother cowered, her claws extended to keep her from sliding on the bouncing, jerking floor, Fast and I paced, our noses down, smelling one distinct dog after another. Fast kept trying to mark the corners of the cage, but every time he tried to stand on three legs, a good jounce from the truck sent him sprawling. Once he even landed on Mother, earning him a quick nip. I gave him a disgusted look. Couldn't he see she was unhappy? Eventually, bored with smelling dogs who weren't even there, I pressed my nose to the wire grate and pulled in great snootfuls of the wind. It reminded me of the first time I'd buried my face in the succulent garbage bins that represented our main source of food. There were thousands of unidentifiable odors out there, all of them coming up my nose with such force I kept sneezing. Fast took up position on the other side of the cage and lay down, not joining me at the side of the cage because it hadn't been his idea. He gave me a surly look every time I sneezed, as if warning me that next time I tried that, I'd better ask him for permission. Each time his cold gaze met my eyes, I would glance pointedly at Mother, who, though obviously cowed by this whole experience, was still in charge as far as I was concerned. When the truck stopped, the woman came around and spoke to us, pressing her palms to the side of the cage for us to lick. Mother stayed where she was, but Fast was as beguiled as I was, and stood next to me, his tail wagging. Oh, you are so cute. You hungry, babies? You hungry? We were parked in front of a long, flat dwelling, sparse desert grasses poking up between the truck's tires. Hey, Bobby! One of the men yelled. The response to his shout was astonishing. From behind the house came a chorus of loud barks, so many I couldn't count the sources. Fast rose up on his back legs and put his paws on the side of the cage, as if that would somehow help him see better. The racket continued as another man emerged from around the side of the house. He was brown and weathered, walking with a slight limp. The way the two other men stood grinning at him carried an air of expectation. When he saw us, he stopped in his tracks, his shoulders slumping. Oh no, senor, not more dogs. We have too many now. He radiated resignation and regret, but there was nothing angry in what I felt coming off him. The woman turned and approached him. We have two puppies and their mother. They are maybe three months old. One of them got away and one of them died. Oh, no. The mother was feral, poor thing. She's terrified. You know what they told you the last time. We have too many dogs and they will not give us a license. I don't care. But, senora, we have no room. Now, Bobby, you know that's not true. And what can we do? Let them live as wild animals? They're dogs, Bobby. Little puppies, you see? The woman turned back to the cage, and I wagged my tail to show her I'd been paying rapt, if uncomprehending, attention. Yeah, Bobby, what's another three more? One of the grinning men asked. One of these days there will be no money to pay you. It will all go to dog food, the man called Bobby replied. The men just shrugged. Grinning. Carlos, I want you to take some fresh hamburger and go back out there to that creek. See if you can find the one that got away, the woman said. The man nodded, laughing at Bobby's expression. I understood that the woman was in charge of this family of humans and gave her another lick on the hand so she would like me best. Oh, you're a good dog, a good dog, she told me. I jumped up and down, my tail wagging so hard it whipped fast in the face, who irritably blinked it off. The one called Carlos smelled of spicy meat and exotic oils that I couldn't identify. He reached in with a pole, snagging Mother, and Fast and I followed willingly as she was led around the side of the house to a large fence. The barking here was deafening, and I felt a slight flicker of fear. Just what were we getting into? Bobby's scent had a citrus quality, oranges, as well as dirt, leather, and dogs. He opened the gate a little, blocking the way with his body. Get back! Get back now! Get back, one! he urged. The barking lessened just a little, 
and when Bobby pulled the gate all the way open and Carlos thrust Mother forward, it ceased completely. I was so astounded by what greeted me. I didn't even feel the foot in my back as Bobby pushed me inside the enclosure. Dogs! There were dogs everywhere! Several were as large as, or even larger, than Mother, and some were smaller, and all were milling freely around in a large enclosure, a huge yard surrounded by a high wooden fence. I scampered forward toward a knot of friendly-looking dogs not much older than myself, halting just as I got to them to pretend to be fascinated by something on the ground. The three dogs in front of me were all light-colored and all females, so I seductively peed on a mound of dirt before joining them to sniff politely at their rear ends. I was so happy at this turn of events I felt like barking, but Mother and Fast were not having as easy a time of it. Mother, in fact, was hunting along the perimeter of the fence, seeking a way out, her nose pressed to the ground. Fast had approached a group of males and now stood stiffly with them, his tail quivering while each took a turn lifting a leg against a fence post. One of the males moved to stand squarely in Fast's path, while another circled back to sniff him aggressively from the rear, and that's when my poor brother folded. His butt sagged, and as he turned to face the male behind him, his tail curved and slid up between his legs. I wasn't at all surprised when seconds later he was on his back, squirming with a certain desperate playfulness. I guessed he was no longer the boss. While all this was happening, another male, muscular and tall, his ears hanging long on the sides of his head, stood absolutely still in the center of the yard, watching Mother run around in desperate circumnavigation. Something told me that of all the dogs in the yard, this was the one to be careful of. And sure enough, when he broke from his rigid stance and padded over toward the fence, the dogs surrounding fast stopped messing around and raised their heads alertly. A dozen yards from the fence, the lone male broke into a full run, bearing down on Mom, who stopped, cringing. The male braced her with his shoulders, blocking her, his tail straight as an arrow. She let herself be sniffed up and down the length of her body, still crouched against the fence. It was my impulse, and I am sure it was also Fast's, to rush to her aid, but I somehow knew this would be wrong. This was the top dog, this male, a thick-boned mastiff with a brown face and dark, roomy eyes. Mother's submission was simply the natural order. After his careful examination, Top Dog aimed an economical stream of urine against the fence, which Mother dutifully examined, and then he trotted off, paying her no more attention. Mother herself seemed deflated, and slid off unnoticed to hide behind a pile of railroad ties. In due course, the pack of males came over to check me over as well, but I crouched low and licked them all in the face, letting them know in no uncertain terms that they'd have zero problems with me. It was my brother who was the troublemaker. All I wanted to do was play with the three girls and explore the yard, which was populated with balls and rubber bones and all sorts of wonderful smells and distractions. A clear trickle of water fell continuously into a trough, providing refreshment whenever we wanted it, and the man named Carlos came into the yard once a day to clean up our messes. At regular intervals, we would all break out in loud barking, for no reason other than the sheer joy of it. And the feedings! Ah! Oh, twice a day! Bobby, Carlos, Senora, and the other man would wade into the pack, separating us out into groups based on age. They would pour bags of rich food into large bowls, and we would bury our faces, eating as much as we could hold. Bobby stood by, and whenever he thought one of the dogs, usually the smallest of the girls, didn't get enough, he would pick her up and give her another handful, pushing the rest of us away. Mother ate with the adult dogs, and occasionally I'd hear a growl from over on their side, though when I looked, all I could see was wagging tails. Whatever they were eating smelled wonderful, but if one of the juveniles tried to wander over there to see what was going on, the men would step in and stop the pup. The woman, Senora, would bend and let us kiss her face, and she would run her hands through our fur and laugh and laugh. My name, she told me, 
was Toby. She said it to me every time she saw me. Toby, Toby, Toby. I was certain I was by far her favorite dog. How could I not be? My best friend was a fawn-colored female named Coco, who had greeted me on my first day. Coco's legs and feet were white, her nose pink, her fur coarse and wiry. She was small enough that I could keep up with her despite my short legs. Coco and I wrestled all day long, usually joined by the other girls and sometimes by Fast, who always wanted to play the game where he wound up the top dog. He had to keep his aggressive play in check, though, because when he became too rambunctious, one of the males would be dispatched to trot over and teach Fast a lesson. When this happened, I always pretended I had never seen him before in my life. I loved my world, the yard. I loved running through the mud by the water trough, my paws making a dirty spatter that flecked my fur. I loved when we'd all start barking, though I seldom understood why we were doing so. I loved chasing Coco and sleeping in a pile of dogs and smelling other dogs' poops. Many days I would drop dead in my tracks, exhausted from play, deliriously happy. The older dogs played, too. Even Top Dog could be seen tearing up the yard, a ragged piece of blanket in his mouth, while the other dogs pursued and pretended not to be able to quite catch up with him. Mother never did, though. She had dug herself a hollow behind the railroad ties and spent most of her time just lying there. When I went to see how she was doing, she growled at me, as if she didn't know who I was. One evening, after dinner, when the dogs were drowsy and sprawled out in the yard, I saw Mother stealthily emerge from her hiding place and creep toward the gate. I was gnawing on a rubber bone, addressing a constant ache in my mouth for something to chew, but I stopped and regarded her curiously as she sat in front of the gate. Was someone coming? I cocked my head, thinking if we were having a visitor, the other dogs would have started barking by now. Many evenings, Carlos and Bobby and the other men would sit at a small table and talk, opening and passing a glass bottle from which came a sharp chemical smell. Not this night, though. The dogs were all alone in the yard. Mother lifted her forelegs off the ground, pressing them against the slats of the wooden gate, and took the metal knob in her mouth. I was baffled. Why, I wondered, would she chew on such a thing when there were all these perfectly good rubber bones scattered about? She twisted her head left and right, apparently unable to get a good bite of the thing. I glanced over it fast, but he was sound asleep. Then, astoundingly, the gate clicked open. My mother had opened the gate. She dropped her paws to the ground and shouldered the gate aside, sniffing cautiously at the air on the other side of the fence. Then she turned to look at me, her eyes bright. The message in them was clear. My mother was leaving. I stood to join her, and Coco, who was lying nearby, lazily lifted her head to blink at me for a moment before sighing and stretching back out in the sand. If I left, I'd never see Coco again. I was torn between loyalty to Mother, who had fed me and taught me and taken care of me, and to the pack, which included my worthless brother, Fast. Mother didn't wait for my decision. She slunk off silently into the gloom of the approaching night. If I wanted to catch up to her, I would have to hurry. I scampered out the open gate, pursuing her into the unpredictable world on the other side of the fence. Fast never saw us go.